Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We now will turn to Tennyson's Mort d'Arthur and the, another part of the story of the telling of King Arthur. I, I want to begin in, in your textbook, though, really quickly on page 1153, just to remind you that we are working with legends and legendary heroes. And w make sure that you've got this information in 2B. Legends, popular stories about the past that have been handed down for generations. Of course, always involving legendary or larger-than-life heroes, a deep concern for right and wrong, and a support for feelings of national pride. We're going to turn now to Tennyson's version of this, Mort d'Arthur. And I'm with you on page 1172, reminding you that you need to study the vocabulary that's there. Of course, the big question again is, can anyone be a hero? And this is a very Arthurian type of question. Because King Arthur, as we saw in our last work with White's text, King Arthur doesn't start out wanting to be the king of England, does he? Tennyson, let's meet him, will meet again in our senior year of study. And Tennyson is such an important poet for us. Notice your dates on 1173. 1809 to, eight, to 1892. So he lived most of the 19th century, didn't he? Alfred Lord Tennyson was born in eastern Lincolnshire in England. I'm reading on 1173. His work was immensely popular during his lifetime and won him the friendship of Queen Victoria. In 1850, Tennyson was appointed Poet Laureate of England. It took Tennyson more than 40 years to complete the Idylls of the King, his epic retelling of the King Arthur legends. By conjuring up a golden Arthurian age and the problems that doomed it, Tennyson expressed the questions people of his own time had about life. The, we call it the Victorian age. Tennyson was known as the poet of the people. Now the background information for this legend, the figure of King Arthur, the legendary ruler of England, may be based on a historical Welsh ruler who resisted Germanic invaders of Britain in the 500s. The first English prose version of the legends, Le Mort d'Arthur, um, was written around 1470 by Sir Thomas Mallory. We will study that version in our senior year. In Mort d'Arthur, Alfred, Lord Tennyson, adapts the tale of Arthur's passing. So now in this reading, we're going to hear about n not Arthur at the beginning of his life, but Arthur at the end of his life. Um, that is to say, how, how does this one end? I'm with you now in 1175. Let's just read and enjoy now the, um, the, the uh, poetry of Tennyson. And again, this is poetry as opposed to prose, right? Mort d'Arthur by Alfred Lord Tennyson. The Epic. At Francis Allen's on the Christmas Eve, the game of forfeits done, the girls all kissed beneath the sacred bush and passed away, the Parson Holmes, the poet Everard Hall, the host and I sat round the wassail bowl, then halfway ebbed, and there we held a talk how all the old honor had from Christmas gone, or gone or dwindled down to some odd games in some odd nooks like this. Till I, tired out with cutting apes that day upon the pond, where three times slipping from the outer edge, I bumped the ice into three several stars, fell in a doze, and half awake, I heard the parson taking wide and wider sweeps, now harping on the church commissioners, now hawking at geology and schism, until I woke and found him settled down upon the general decay of faith, right through the world. At home was little left and none abroad. There was no anchor, none to hold by. Francis, laughing, clapped his hand on Everard's shoulder with, I hold by him, and I, quoth Everard, by the wassail bowl. Why, yes, I said, we knew your gift that way at college, but another which you had. I mean a verse, or so we held it then. What came of that? You know, said Frank, he burnt his epic, his King Arthur, some twelve books. And then to me, demanding why. Oh, sir, he thought that nothing new was said, or else something so said twas nothing, that a truth looks freshest in the fashion of the day. God knows he has a mint of reasons. Ask, it pleased me well enough. Nay, nay, said Hall. 1176. Why take the style of those heroic times? For nature brings not back the mastodon, nor we those times. And why should any man remodel models? 
These twelve books of mine were faint Homeric echoes, nothing worth, mere chaff and draff, much better burnt. But I, said Francis, picked the eleventh from this hearth and have it. Keep a thing, its use will come. I hoard it as a sugar plum for Holmes. He laughed, and I, though sleepy, like a horse that hears the corn bin open, pricked my ears. For I remembered Everard's college fame when we were freshmen. Then at my request he brought it, and the poet, little urged, but with some prelude of disparagement, read. Mouthing out his hollow O's and A's, deep-chested music, and to this result. All right, let's pause for a moment. Notice how the poem is set up. It begins by a group of people sitting around on Christmas Eve, lamenting with a religious person, a parson, that things have changed, that no one takes seriously Christmas Eve anymore, and by extension it seems maybe England has changed as well. Then there is this suggestion that one of them once told, uh, had, had a collection of, of lines about King Arthur that were, gr that were great storytelling, but the author had kind of said, you know, it was a waste of time, wasn't very good. Notice the line on page 1176, why should any man remodel models? I'm done with it, it's over, obviously creating a sense of interest, right? Now we're going to get to Mort D'Arthur, all right? So here we go. Mort, by the way, meaning death, right? The death of Arthur. Dartour. So all day long the noise of battle rolled among the mountains by the winter sea, until King Arthur's table, man by man, had fallen in Leoness about their lord, King Arthur. Then, because his wound was deep, the bold Sir Bedivere uplifted him, Sir Bedivere, the last of all his knights, and bore him to a chapel nigh the field. A broken chancel with a broken cross that stood on a dark strait of barren land. On one side lay the ocean, and on one lay a great water, and the moon was full. Then spake King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, The sequel of today unsolders all the goodliest fellowship of famous knights whereof this world holds record. Such a sleep they sleep. The men I loved. 1177. I think that we shall never more, at any future time, delight our souls with talk of knightly deeds, walking about the gardens and the halls of Camelot as in the days that were. I perish by this people which I made. Though Merlin swear that I should come again to rule once more, but let what will be be. I am so deeply smitten through the helm that without help I cannot last till morn. Thou... All right, let's pause for a moment. Now, we are at the end of Arthur's life, yes? The events that have preceded have to do, I'll just give you a brief summary of this, have to do with the fact that Arthur will marry the beautiful Guinevere. He will have his best friend Lancelot, the great warrior. Lancelot and Guinevere will have a thing. Arthur will have a, a sexual liaison with his half-sister that will produce his son, Mordred. Mordred and Arthur will have fought in a battle and Mordred will have been killed by his father and Mordred will have mortally wounded his father. All of that is proceeding to what we are now working on. These are the final words of Arthur. Notice that Arthur will say two things. One, it's over. The old days are over. They have come, they have gone. Back to, by the way, our emphasis on worldview. Tennyson himself, writing at the very end of the 19th century, roughly the 1880s, was acutely aware that England was beginning itself to have some kind of cultural self-doubts, especially given the rise of the great American nation that was about to start to happen, right? Especially economically. And so Tennyson will speak through the words of Arthur to say, it's over, it's all done. Number two, Merlin has predicted the once and future king. Arthur will return. And this notion of Arthur the king coming back is central to how we read so much of this legend and this myth, especially if we're English, okay? So notice he says it, uh, it's over. And 
Now, the only question remaining is what to do with the sword Excalibur. The sword, of course, that we heard about in our previous reading that was at the early phase of Arthur's life when he was a young boy, drawn out of the anvil and the stone. All right, here we go. Now, we're going to have some um, instructions that are going to be given to Sir Bedivere about the sword. Therefore, take my brand, Excalibur, which was my pride. For thou rememberest how in those old days, one summer noon, an arm rose up from out the bosom of the lake, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, holding the sword. And how I rode across and took it, and have worn it like a king. And wheresoever I am sung or told in after time, this also shall be known. But now delay not, take Excalibur, and fling him far into the middle mere. Watch what thou seest, and lightly bring me word. All right. So for the Monty Python fans in the house, of course, we're a huge uh, Monty Python's quest for the Holy Grail. Uh, in 303, strange women lying in ponds, there's no basis for a system of government, etc., etc. All comes, of course, from these lines. Notice in this rendition, the lady in the lake, lying in a pond, holds up Excalibur and Arthur is able to get it. So notice in this version, Arthur actually comes to the sword Excalibur, not through the sword in the stone, but rather uh, from this woman lying in the lake. Now what Arthur's going to tell Bedivere to do is, I want for the sword to be returned back to the lake. Take it and throw it in the water and come back and tell me what happens. So notice Bedivere is now going to be given a task, like often we see in these kinds of legendary stories, yes? The task is, throw the sword back into the water. Let's see what happens. To him replied the bold Sir Bedivere, It is not meet, Sir King, to leave thee thus, aidless, alone, and smitten through the helm. A little thing may harm a wounded man, yet I thy hest will all perform at full. Watch what I see, and lightly bring thee word. So saying, from the ruined shrine he stepped, and in the moon, athwart the place of tombs, where lay the mighty bones of ancient men, old knights, and over them the sea wind sang shrill, chill, with flakes of foam. 1178. He, stepping down by zigzag paths and juts of pointed rock, came on the shining levels of the lake. There drew he forth the brand Excalibur, and o'er him drawing it the winter moon, brightening the skirts of a long cloud, ran forth and sparkled keen with frost against the hilt. For all the haft twinkled with diamond sparks, myriads of topaz lights and jacinth work of subtlest jewelry. He gazed so long that both his eyes were dazzled as he stood, this way and that, dividing the swift mind in act to throw. But at the last, it seemed better to leave Excalibur concealed there in the many knotted water flags that whistled still and dry about the marge. So strode he back slow to the wounded king. He disobeys, right? He disobeys then the orders of the king. King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, Hast thou performed my mission which I gave? What is it thou hast seen or what hast heard? And answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, I heard the ripple washing in the reeds, and the wild water lapping on the crag. To whom replied King Arthur, faint and pale, Thou hast betrayed thy nature and thy name, he knows not why. rendering true answer, as beseemed thy fealty, nor like a noble knight. For sure sign had followed either hand or voice, or else a motion of the mere. This is a shameful thing for men to lie. Yet now I charge thee, quickly go again as thou art leaf and dear, and do the thing I bade thee. Watch, and lightly bring me word. Second time. Then went Sir Bedivere the second time across the ridge, and paced beside the mere, counting the dewy pebbles fixed in thought. But when he saw the wonder of the hilt, how curiously and strangely chaste, he smote his palms together 
and he cried aloud. 1179. And if indeed I cast the brand away, surely a precious thing, one worthy note, should thus be lost forever from the earth, which might have pleased the eyes of many men. What good should follow this if this were done? What harm undone? Deep harm to disobey, seeing obedience is the bond of rule. Were it well to obey then, if a king demand an act unprofitable against himself? The king is sick, and knows not what he does. What record or what relic of my lord should be to after time, but empty breath and rumors of a doubt? But were this kept, stored in some treasure house of mighty kings, someone might show it at a joust of arms, saying, King Arthur's sword, Excalibur, wrought by the lonely maiden of the lake. Nine years she wrought it, sitting in the deeps upon the hidden bases of the hills. So might some old man speak in the aftertime to all the people winning reverence. But now much honor and much fame were lost. So spake he, clouded with his own conceit, and hid Excalibur the second time and so strode back slow to the wounded king. All right, let's pause. Now, uh, we have a word which kind of defines what we mean when we talk about the proper behavior of knights. We call it chivalry. And foundational to chivalry is obedience. That is to say, Arthur has told Bedivere, go throw the sword in the lake. For the second time now, Bedivere reasons, this is bad form. We shouldn't get rid of the sword. It should be an important memorial. It's such an important piece of our history. I'm going to hide it and lie a second time and tell Arthur that when I threw it into the water, you know, the wind blew on the water, and that was basically it. Of course, Arthur is going to know he's been lied to. Obviously, good stories make us predict, as we have said before. Let's finish now. Then spoke King Arthur, breathing heavily, What is it thou hast seen, or what hast heard? And answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, I heard the water lapping on the crag, and the long ripple washing in the reeds. To whom replied King Arthur, much in wrath, Oh, miserable and unkind, untrue, unknightly, traitor-hearted, Woe is me, authority forgets a dying king, laid widowed of the power in his eye that bowed the will. I see thee what thou art, for thou the latest left of all my knights, in whom should meet the offices of all. Thou wouldst betray me for the precious hilt, either from lust of gold or like a girl valuing the giddy pleasure of the eyes. 1180. Yet, for a man may fail in duty twice, and the third time may prosper, get thee hence. But if thou spare to fling Excalibur, I will arise and slay thee with my hands. He threatens to kill him. Then quickly rose Sir Bedivere and ran, and leaping down the ridges lightly, plunged among the bulrush beds and clutched the sword, and strongly wheeled and threw it. He throws it. The great brand made lightnings in the splendor of the moon, and flashing round and round, and whirled in an arch, shot like a streamer of the northern moon. Seen were the moving isles of winter shock by night, with noises of the northern sea. So flashed and fell the brand Excalibur. But ere he dipped the surface, rose an arm, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, and caught him by the hilt, the lady and the lake. brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mere, and lightly went the other to the king. Then spoke King Arthur, drawing thicker breath, Now see I by thine eyes that this is done. Speak out, what is it thou hast heard or seen? And answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, Sir King, I closed mine eyelids, lest the gems should blind my purpose, for I never saw nor shall see here or elsewhere till I die, not though I live three lives of mortal men, so great a miracle as yonder hilt. Then with both hands I flung him, wheeling him, 
But when I looked again, behold, an arm, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, that caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mirror. And answer made King Arthur, breathing hard, My end draws nigh. He knows it's time Tis to die. time that I were gone. Make broad thy shoulders to receive my weight, and bear me to the margin. Yet I fear my wound hath taken cold, and I shall die. 1181. So saying, from the pavement he half rose, slowly with pain reclining on his arm, and looking wistfully with wide blue eyes as in a picture. Him Sir Bedivere remorsefully regarded through his tears, and would have spoken, but he found not words. Grief, right? Then took with care, and kneeling on one knee, o'er both his shoulders drew the languid hands, and rising bore him through the place of tombs. But as he walked, King Arthur panted hard, like one that feels a nightmare on his bed when all the house is mute. So sighed the king, muttering and murmuring at his ear, Quick! Quick, I fear it is too late, and I shall die. But the other swiftly strode from ridge to ridge, clothed with his breath, and looking as he walked larger than human on the frozen hills. He heard the deep behind him, and a cry before. His own thought drove him like a goad. Dry clashed his harness in the icy caves and barren chasms, and all to left and right the bare black cliff clanged round him as he based his feet on juts of slippery crag that rang sharp smitten with a dint of armored heels. And on a sudden, lo, the level lake and the long glories of the winter moon. Then saw they how there hove a dusky barge, dark as a funeral scarf from stem to stern beneath them, and descending they were